My name is Michael Cullum. That's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm going to be up here for the next hour. So if you want to tweet um, feedback uh, or abuse at me, um, whatever, whatever goes, um, I'm completely defenseless. Um, so go for it. Um, it'll be in the corner of most, a bunch of my slides as well. I work for a company called Sam Knows. Um, Sam Knows, we do internet measurement data. Um, we do deal with huge amounts of data. We do cool things with it, data intelligence, machine learning, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. Um, if any of you are looking for a job, um, then we're hiring. So come and chat to me afterwards. I've just joined the Symphony core team as a security lead. Um, I am also on the core committee of the PHP FIG. I used to be a FIG secretary until quite recently. Um, and I'm also on the management team of PHP BB. So if you're interested in any of these projects, come have a chat with me afterwards. But you're not here to listen to me talk about myself, um, no matter how much I like, might like that. Um, you're here to learn about graphs, right? And I don't kind of mean this kind of graph, um, although this is a cool graph. Um, Gra gra graphs are cool. Um, they, they, they show us interesting things. We're here to learn about this kind of graph. So uh, throughout this talk, I'm actually going to use GitHub as an example. It's something that we're all quite familiar with. Um, we'll talk about users. We'll talk about repositories. Um, but if we start to think about this as a graph, we have you as a central user. Um, and then so we want to expand out. We want to look at the organizations you belong to. So I belong to Sam Knows and Symphony, for example. Now, inside that organization, uh, Symphony, we've got a whole bunch of other users. Um, that might be Fabian, it might be Nicholas, it might be other core contributors. I also have a Sam Knows organization, for example, um, and that contains a bunch of repositories. So some of those are private, some of those are public, um, and then we have a whole load of commits. Now, each one of these is an object. Um, now, object oriented programming, um, I'm not kind of going to go into the depths of, but you can kind of begin to represent this in the graph. Um, and when you use something like GraphQL, the relationships are um, first-class citizens um, and how they all relate to each other. So first of all, I'm just going to talk very briefly about REST APIs. Who's used REST APIs quite extensively? OK, basically the entire room. Wonderful. Um, so with your standard REST API, um, you've got a number of endpoints. You've got gets, you've got posts, um, and hopefully a whole bunch of other HTTP verbs um, that you're all using correctly, right? Um, so if you want to get content, and by the way, by get, I don't mean post content, um, and I want to have a look at like a specific repository, um, I do get repos uh, ID, um, and it would return the correct status code, because you're using the right status codes as well, right? Yeah, OK. That's the correct answer. Um, it's the OK answer. Um, returns to, uh, 200 OK. Might get some organizations. We might get a specific organization. But then here, what we start to do is we start to say, actually, I want to look at the repositories for that organization. And if you think back to that graph that I was showing you earlier, um, that's sort of like a child um, in a graph, uh, in a REST context. Now, always assuming children actually can kind of confuse um, uh, sort of the way of thinking about it. And so if you think about them as connections, um, then you can traverse the graph in any way that you choose. And REST isn't, this is one of the things that REST isn't quite so great at. And then finally, down the bottom, I've got a post org, so creating an organization. And again, 201, because you're using the right response codes. A REST API might look a little bit like this. Um, this is kind of fake, and it's also not a great um, uh, REST API. Um, it's just something I grabbed off the internet. Um, so you'll notice in here that there are lots of links. That was why I grabbed this example. There's lots of links in it. We've got a link to itself. Um, we've got a limit, so a bunch of stuff to do with pagination. Um, we've, and then we've got sort of uh, relationships. And we say, call this other link, um, this other URL, and then we'll send you through. And you can essentially traverse a REST API um, a little bit like, uh, a, way, like a, a human can browse the internet. You go onto a search engine, you click on a thing, you click on another thing, you click on another thing. It's very rare, actually, now for you to type in a complete URL to a specific page on a website. H when was the last time you did that? Like Probably a week ago. Um, or when you were testing something, but the common user doesn't type a full URL. Now, that's a good REST API if you can follow all the links, but not all of them have that. If you don't have links in your REST API, it's not really a REST API. GraphQL, so moving on from REST. We'll come back to sort of like the differences later. So what is GraphQL? 
GraphQL has two, th two things. It's a query language for your API, and it's also a server-side runtime for executing queries using a type system you define. What? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, so essentially, there are two different portions to it. You have the actual uh, language that you query with. It is a query language, um, just like SQL is, for example, when you're querying on a database. Um, and then it's the other side. It's the actual um, system of managing types. So in the, um, our GitHub example, we have users, we have repositories, we have commits, we have more users, um, and we have a whole bunch of other different types of, um, uh, types of entity. Let's have a look at like starting to query this, right? This is um, something in GraphQL. This is a request. And what I'm saying is on the me object, I want to get the property name. I want to get my name. Um, it is just as simple. Like this is, this, is, this is the most bare bones sort of thing you can do. Um, getting a property off of an object. And this is what it returns. Um, it returns my name, Michael Cullum. And it returns it in exactly the same format that um, I requested it in. And it only returns me the fields that I specifically asked for. So again, we've got me here, which is the object. And then inside of that, we've got the property name, which has the value Michael Cullum. So it's given me that data. It's given me the name of the me object. Now I can add others. I can add company in here. Because um, let's say I want to know what my company is. I run that, and again, I get that extra property back. I find out what that property value is. And that property value is Sam Knows. And again, you'll see that like company, the exact words I've used here is exactly the same. It's uh, the, the, the request, a response will always mirror the request unless you ask it specifically not to, which I'll go into later. Now, this is great for scalar values, um, but I was talking all about graphs and stuff like that earlier, um, which means that we're gonna have to like nest objects at some point, right? So let's nest an object. Now, we're talking about GitHub, so let's have a look at some repositories. So I want to get the name of um, a couple of repositories. So I specify an object here, repos, which is a property, but it's not a scalar property. It's a, it's a list. So therefore, I say, for each of these repos, I want to get the name. So that's exactly what I have. I have repos, and then I have a list of repos. There, might be, there would be more on there. Um, and then I just get the name of the repo, which is that property. And again, it's in exactly the same format. So I said I'm going to use GitHub as an example quite a lot throughout this talk. Um, so I'm also going to use um, the, so there's a tool called um, Gra um, Graph IQL, um, which is interactive essentially. It allows you to customize your requests in one side. Um, it will do uh, um, auto completion, et cetera, for you. Um, and then it will tell you the results. Um, so let's have a look at some stuff to do with that. Right, can you see that at the back? Oh, that's a bit much. Can you see that at the back? Yeah, cool. So here what I'm doing, um, pretend that this word query doesn't exist. Yeah. So here we are, I'm looking at a viewer object. Viewer um, in GitHub's context kind of means me, um, the person who is viewing the API. I've signed in as myself. Um, this is actually touching on GitHub's production data. Um, I'm just going to have to try very hard in this live demo not to accidentally show you any private repos. Um, so login is the property on here that essentially gives you my username. Um, and my username is Michael Cullen. So that's really simple, right? Now like we can do something a bit, we can look at other things, uh, other types of object. So on the, um, uh, on the uh, GitHub API, one of the things it lets you get is a series of codes of conduct. Um, so a code of conduct is an object, um, and it has a name field. So when I was saying about all the auto-completion, this is what I mean. And it also tells me the type, which is really useful because my memory isn't that great. It's also why I feel brave enough to do a live demo. So here I can just see it's, it's say, saying that there are two code of conduct objects that it's finding. Um, and in each of these code of conduct objects, I'm getting the name property. Now I can add some more. Um, I can get a description, I think. No, I can't. Um, I can get the body. Um, I can get, 
I can get a euro. So there we go. So now I'm actually getting the full body of all of these um, codes of conduct. Now, that's great, but realistically, like, I don't actually want to get the full body of every single code of conduct. So let's say um, I just want to look at one. So one of the fields that I grabbed here was key. Um, now, the reason, oh no, I didn't grab key. So I can see here, contribute to covenant, that's a key. Now, I'll show you exactly how this works in a moment, but essentially what I want to do is I want to only look at one. Help if I didn't lock my screen. And there we go, I'm just. And I can just look at one. Thanks. There you go. So I can just look at one as well. Um, and that really depends on the kind of object that I'm querying, whether or not I'm looking at an array. Um, or whether or not I'm looking at a single object. So let's come back here. So what you just saw me do is I was passing in an argument. Um, so essentially what this actually is, is it's kind of, it's essentially a, a, a function, um, if you consider that in, in sort of PHP terminology. Um, so I'm passing in an argument, um, and all arguments are named. Um, this is not something we really have in PHP. You can't say which arguments you're, which you're giving. Um, you can only sort of pass in uh, um, all of the arguments or just the uh, required ones. So I'm saying login, so that's the variable name. Um, that's the key. Um, and then I'm saying that the value of that equals Michael Cullum, and then I want to look at the name for that. And then I get back exactly the same thing that we were looking at earlier. Um, this means I can look at all of the users. Um, I can say I actually just care about this one. Um, because I generally don't care about, I don't want to get every single user on GitHub, I want to get this one user, and I want to specify which user. So I can also use arguments on pro scalar properties though. Um, now GitHub, I couldn't find examples of where they do this, um, so I can't give you a live demo of this um, with, with the GitHub um, part, but essentially what you could do is say I want name and height. Um, now, who prefers metric? Who prefers feet? One guy, okay. <laughs> it's 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 fine. Who measures the height in feet, though? Exactly. So most of you, yeah. You're not you're not alone. Well, we we are, but um, so we can specify the specific unit that we want. So we can say I want my height in foot because whilst I might normally default to metric, um, I prefer metric. Um, I prefer my height in feet. So it would then come up with Michael and six foot four. Um, and essentially, what I can do is I can just use that for manipulation of a scalar field. Um, so arguments can kind of go wherever, which is an odd concept um, that we might not be used to. So something I've talked about a lot is that the request and the response match each other. Now, if they always match each other, um, like this, we've got me, we've got company, name company, and then again here, we've got user, name, repos, again, all the structure matches. What happens when I want to get more than one user? Because here, I've got user, um, and then I've got myself, like I'm coming up. Um, but what, well, let's say I want to get the data on two users. I want to get the data on um, the two most common, uh, the two most popular users on GitHub, um, or a high, with highest number of contributions. Now, that's Fabian and Andrew. Um, I don't know who this Andrew guy is, uh, but Fabian, um, I, I expect most of you do know. Um, we use something called aliases. So aliases allow us to actually change the response and use different keys. Um, if I had two users, it would throw an error. Um, you saw what an error looked like earlier accidentally. Um, I was going to show it to you properly later, but you've already seen it. Um, so what I can say is I want this object to be called Andrew, and I want this one to be called Fabian. And what I want you to do is get me a user and pass in this argument. And that looks like this. So we've got Fabian here, Fabian, Andrew. Andrew, and then we're still throwing through that name because the name is the property that we're getting. Now, that's great when you're only looking at one field, but let's say that you want to have multiple different fields in there. You want to have like name, email, company. Now, 
As a developer, this makes me hurt. This makes me want to cry because I'm seeing, I'm repeating the same thing, right? Um, which we all know is bad practice. But GraphQ, uh, GraphQL can handle this for us using something called fragments. So what we do is we say fragment user details on user. So what we're saying is I want to create a fragment. The name of that fragment is user details. And we want to create it on a user type. So I haven't really talked too much about types. Um, I'll go into that a bit more depth later. But essentially what we're doing is we're looking at a user type here. Um, and then what I do is I include user details. And then it essentially repeats this, the name, email, company, in both Michael and Fabian on there. So if I jump back across to GitHub, I have a play with this. So um, let's go with... So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just duplicating what I was kind of just talking about. So then we've got that behavior that I was saying, and you can see the alias is working. So we've got Fabian here, we've got Michael, and Fabian and Michael. Can you see at the bottom of the screen at the back? Is it, does, it, what, what, does it cut off like sort of there with heads, or can you see the whole thing? Oh, you've got screens back there, fantastic. Um, okay, so now um, I want to add a couple of extra fields, so let's add uh, email, please don't spam me. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, and let's grab company as well. This uses a funky editor, just like all of GitHub's uh, stuff, and therefore it tries to do... <laughs> There we go. So I can run that, and I've got those extra fields. Now I'll extract this out into a fragment. And I'm not going to try retyping it, because it won't let me. Um, now the fragment um, sits outside of the query that we're doing here. Fragment user details on And then I just paste the exact fields in here, um, almost as if it is actually in here itself. Now, what it, if I actually just did name here, and I ran this, it would actually error. Um, if you define a fragment and don't use it, it will error at you. Um, so you can't just simply load every single one of your uh, fragments or transformers, I suppose, as you could kind of liken them to. Um, you can't just load every single one on every single query. Um, you have to only load the ones that you need. Um, so then I use the ellipse operator um, to say, essentially, expand user details here. And then we'll see that that's exactly the same response. This makes life so much easier in terms of, um, having to, instead of having to duplicate things 100 times, um, you can just specify exactly what you need. So we've looked at a lot of properties and that kind of thing. Um, let's start have a look at operations, um, because we want to do things a little bit more dynamically. Now, when we're having a look um, at uh, all of the previous ones that we've been doing, I've said I've just omitted that query keyword. Um, the query keyword is unnecessary, but recommended. Um, so all of the previous examples that you've seen, just add query um, at the beginning, and you'll be following best practices. Now, just like in PHP, we can have anonymous functions, um, or particularly in JavaScript, JavaScript does this a lot. Um, it's a lot better to name them. Um, it makes debugging easier, it makes it a lot easier to find things, um, particularly when you get one of those errors and you've got like, a long query. So what you can do is you can also name your functions or your operations. Um, so here I want to get user and company. 
Um, now, the advantage of this is that you can start to pass in variables that aren't part of your specific um, GraphQL request body. Um, so it's not part of your query. Now, why might you want to do this? Why can't I just like insert it into the query as I build it? Um, if you try to do string manipulation to generate your GraphQL query, then you're not going to enjoy your life. Um, it's going to be an absolute pain in the ass. It's going to be horrible to unit test. It's going to be horrible to develop on. Um, how many people like, still spend a lot of time uh, using uh, string manipulating queries together instead of uh, using a, some kind of query builder? Um, it's a similar kind of situation. So what you want to do is you want to say, hi, I'm just going to pass in this variable. Um, and you can specify types. So I'm going to talk a lot more about types. But for here, I'm just going to say this is a string. We all know what this string is. Um, this exclamation point, what this does is it says that it's required. An exclamation point means that a, uh, an argument is required. You can't, it will just simply error if it's null. Um, if I excluded this, then it would mean that null is passable. Um, now, the way that GraphQL handles null is that there is one null, everything is that same null. It's not like each individual type has its own null version. So it's not like the null of a uh, integer would be zero, it's just null. Um, so I grab the login here, um, as I say I want a string, um, and then I say I want the user for this particular login, and I want to the name, I want company, and I want is hireable. And then separately, I give it a, another body of text, which is the variables. Um, so for example, let's say this was a curl request. Um, I might say here is the body, which is essentially the query, um, and here are the variables. They're two completely separate things that you send in your request. Now we can do more things with this as well. We can do um, if statements. So let's say that I um, only want, I want to be able to have this, um, this method, um, this operation, but I want to use it for two things. Um, it's not exactly the best practice in this example, but it's simple enough that it kind of makes sense. Um, so what I say is, is hireable? Um, I've actually missed out the um, argument here for hireable. That's my mistake, it should be a Boolean in there. Um, and then it's exactly the same, name, company, is hireable, but then I have this particular thing here. Um, now, what that says is only include it if hireable is true. Um, this should be uh, a Boolean. Um, now, you can also uh, have the opposite of this, and you can say um, if it's not that, essentially. So let's have another quick look. So um, let's grab, uh, I only want to look at one. I'll just get rid of this fragment. Let's have a look at two. Make things a bit simpler. Um, now, I've kind of hidden this down here, um, query variables. So this is where in the UI it allows me to insert those variables. So I want to grab login. Uh, And here, as I said, I'm inserting the query text just to make it um, so it works. And I want to get company of user. Oops. Um, So if I run this, it will fail. Um, and the reason being is because I've said that this login here is required, and that's what that exclamation point is for. Um, I'm just going to get rid of all of that comment text. It's getting in the way. So yeah, so here we can see um, the string uh, was provided with an invalid value. Now, what I can do down here is, uh, that's actually. If I go down here, I can specify what that login variable should be. So, oh, it's auto completed that for me. Um, so I can say that this one I want Fabian. I can complete that, run this, and essentially it just auto fills that data. Kind of like code, right? Kind of like a you know query language. Um, now, if I decide that I want to add another one on here, so I can add is hireable. Um, include if hireable. 
And then I can specify another thing up here. And then I can specify, you see, this code complete, it's like nice, but not. Um, there we go. So now, because I've passed in true, it will tell me that Fabian um, is hireable, apparently. Great. Um, however, if I put false, <laughs> then it will not like me very much. There we go. And it will then hide that field. So you can um, use one particular thing of query language, um, send it multiple times, and just customize the variables, which can help you when you're actually crafting these queries. It can make your life a lot easier. So I've talked a lot about fetching data. Now, fetching data, GraphQL is very, very good at fetching data. I prefer it for fetching data. Um, uh, Using it to write data feels a bit odd, um, particularly seeing as you use a get all the time. Um, all of GraphQL is on a single endpoint. Um, you send it your query, you send it your variables, it returns a response to you. It's slash GraphQL normally is, is kind of the standard, um, and it's a get. Um, but you can uh, modify data. Now let's have a look at how we do that. So what we do is we, first of all, and this isn't actually strictly required, um, but it's good practice to do it. Instead of saying query, I say it's a mutation. Um, it's a different type of operation that I'm doing. I'm doing a mutation. I'm changing something. Um, then what I do is I specify what this operation is called. Now, again, this is completely unnecessary. It's just simply useful to have it there for debugging purposes. Um, I specify the user. Um, and then I specify the input, repo input. Um, now, we'll have a look at that in the, on the next slide. Um, and then what I do is I run this. Um, uh, operation, essentially, because all of these are operations. Uh, when I'm talking about user um, and grabbing that, what I'm actually doing is I'm running an operation to get that user. It then returns to me an object, and that's what I'm manipulating. So I'm saying create repo for this user um, and this repo, and it will automate, and then it will persist that. And then it will return to me what it's created in the form that, format that I've asked it to, um, which is name and description, not name and repo. Sorry about that. Now, the way that I define like a repo, uh, an input format, is that you say for your, uh, in your schema, which we'll come on to in a moment, um, we say input, we say repo input, and then you can specify all of your different fields. You can say their types. You can say if they're nullable. You can even specify that they be another type. Um, so for example, I could say uh, repo name description, um, and then I could have um, uh, organization, and I could specify that that be of the type organization. Um, and this allows you to create an entire object when putting it in there. So schemas, how does this work on the other side? So that was all about how we can query GraphQL. Um, but how do we actually define the schema of our own GraphQL? Um, of our own, um, and the thing is, is that even if you're only querying a GraphQL ever, it's still use, very useful to understand like, how this type system works. And the type system primarily belongs on the server. Um, but using tools like um, GraphIQL, um, it allows you to validate, essentially, your graph, uh, your, all your queries before you actually ever send them, um, which you can't do in uh, languages like PHP in quite the same way, unless you use strict types, use strict types. Um, so I'm going to create a type here. I'm going to create a conference talk, um, and then I specify the different properties on this. Um, I'm just using an arbitrary syntax um, on here, but essentially you would define this in your code. Um, so first of all, I'm going to have a title, which is a string. It's not nullable. I'm going to have a speaker, also not nullable. Um, you can't have a talk without a speaker. That would be odd. Um, it's going to be in a track. Um, now, you can see here is that I have defined a custom type here um, called track. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Now, I've also and I've got ratings. And what I'm using is I'm using this list syntax. So that allows me to essentially have an array of different rating. So by this, I'm meaning kind of joined in, kind of that kind of thing. Now, you'll notice I've got an exclamation mark on the inside here. What that means is that I can't give it a null review. So I couldn't, I would have like, if I had an array and I had two reviews in it and one element that was null, it wouldn't allow that null element. However, 
there is an exclamation mark after the list, which means that I, it's having no reviews is absolutely fine. It just prevents a review from being null. It doesn't prevent the list from being null. If I wanted to say that there must be reviews on this talk, um, remember join.in, um, there must be. Um, then add an exclamation mark here, and that would essentially require that. And you can use these lists, and you can nest them, um, et cetera, et cetera. So at the root of all the schema, you have um, something called query. So we were talking about query earlier, and that thing that I was talking about adding at the beginning, mutation. Um, essentially what this does is it defines the highest level um, of uh, functions that you're kind of running, the things that you're doing. So I'm saying, hi, I want to look at this talk. I want to look at the talk ID. Um, I want to look at the speaker. I want to look at this review. Um, so that's where you're defining all of those like upper level operations to go and get like a specific one or to get a, a series of them. Um, I won't cover pagination in much detail um, in this talk. I might bring it up in a GitHub demo just to show you if we've got time. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying talk, I want to throw in the argument ID and it's of the type ID. So ID is a special type in GraphQL. Um, and I want to return a conference talk. Um, if it's a review, it will return a review. If it's a speaker, it will return a speaker object. And these are special objects that I, and types that I've defined, um, almost like a class. Now, it comes with a series of inbuilt types. Um, those are string, integer, float, boolean, and id. Um, id, it will default to if you're sort of doing, uh, doing a lookup and you haven't like, specified what, uh, exactly what field it is. Now, you can also have your custom types. Um, which should look a bit like this conference talk here. This is a type, a custom type. So you would add this onto the series of the others. And you can also have enums. Uh, who knows what an enum is? Most of you, that's fantastic. Derek, we should definitely get this in PHP core. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, seriously, though. Um, <laughs> Touche. Um, so enums um, are fantastic. Um, they allow us to have um, a series of different values, and only one of these values can be specified. Um, so at this conference, we have three tracks. We have the Redshift track, the, um, I don't actually know how to pronounce this, which is awkward, because it's a track that I'm speaking, Merkai? M Makari, Makari. We have the Makari track and the Byte Mark track. Um, and that means that when I'm specifying here the track, it means it has to be one of those three values. I can't specify anything else. Um, it's almost like having an in array on a string, for those of you that have not used enum, enums before, but better, like much better, because it's a type, right? Um, and the final thing kind of on this, uh, before I go into how to do this in PHP, is uh, introspection. Um, and I'm just going to jump straight into GitHub and show you this. So with um, a REST API, what you commonly need to do is you need to define it in a format like Swagger. Um, you need to put it on um, an awful tool like API-ry um, in order to be able to document it or that kind of thing. Now, with GraphQL, you can actually ask the API to give you its documentation itself because the schema documents the API. Um, you can see all the fields. You can see the types of those fields. You can, bless you, um, you can see the description of all the fields. Um, and you can actually just ask GraphQL to give that to you. Um, so let's grab a fresh one. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of these special types. So they have a whole bunch of inbuilt um, uh, types that are special that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but one of these is schema. Um, and what schema will do? <laughs> Bless you. That was two in, in perfect harmony. <laughs> Um, so from schema, um, I can get um, a list of t uh, an array of types. So I'm actually just using plain old GraphQL here. I'm, I'm looking at uh, types, and it's the reason it's erroring at me is because that's actually an array. Um, and then under the types, I can say I want the name of the type, I want the fields of the type, I want the kind of the type. Um, and then under fields, again, this is another array. So you're starting to see like how we can nest things here. Um, and all I'm doing is querying GraphQL itself. Um, so again, I can say name, uh, description. Um, I can see if it's deprecated. I'll talk a bit about deprecations in, in a moment. Um, and I can get also its type of the field. Oh. So this will be huge, by the way. Um, 
So what we see here is it's showing me all of the different, um, different types that it can give you. So under query, so that top level um, that we're looking at, um, we can see code of conduct, we can see codes of conduct, we can see the, which is what we were looking at earlier. Um, we can see the, uh, the plural and the singular there. Um, if I actually ask for arguments over here, it would tell me that under code of conduct, there is one argument, which is the um, ID of the code of conduct, or the key. Um, I can see licenses. Um, if I scroll down a bit more, um, I can see organizations. Um, that's something we're all familiar with. Um, I can see uh, users, and down here somewhere will be repositories as well. So essentially what this is doing is it's telling me things like the description, the currently authenticated user, is the field deprecated, yes or no, um, and I can see the type. Um, now, if I use something called kind of, um, then it will kind of show me the type. Um, okay, that, that, yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> worth a try, right? Um, we can also get the name of a type, which will often return as null. It's just kind of a quirk of GraphQL um, in terms of when you're looking at uh, objects versus scalar types. As soon as you get down to scalar types, these fields will like say string, et cetera. Um, so this is really cool. Like I can look at all the different, uh, I can actually look at GraphQL itself. Um, and I don't need to document my API, right? Um, now, with deprecations, um, it's really cool. Um, the reason that deprecations are cool in GraphQL is because what you can do on a field is you can just specify a deprecation reason um, uh, as one of the um, uh, properties of a field. And what it will then say to you is it will give you, um, when you're querying this, it will say, is deprecated true? It does that magically for you. Um, and it will then also give you a deprecated reason. And this allows you to um, uh, deprecate parts of your API um, in ways that you, you can't really do in a REST API because you can't query it about itself, really. Um. So, server side. Um, this is probably the most popular library for GraphQL um, in PHP. Um, it uh, will essentially give you all of the bootstrapping you need. Um, it's a dependency of like most common GraphQL, other GraphQL libraries that you'll see. Now, this runs on a single endpoint file. I'm not going to show it to you um, because it's boring, honestly. Um, Essentially what it does, it will grab some input, it will register all of your um, uh, object types, so like query it will, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, and then it allows you to just execute that, it will return a response to you. Now, when we're defining a type, what does that look like? So I mentioned um, that we uh, uh, want to always have um, uh, something like called, called query at the top level. I'm kind of ignoring that for now. So I just want to define a user type. Um, I give it a description. I say it's our blog visitor. Um, I specify some fields. I specify first name. I have a description on each of those fields. I have the type of those fields. So this is the most important thing here, right? Um, I'm essentially doing a check to make sure it's a, uh, it's a, it's a string. Um, I've also got an email field, which is also a string. And I don't bother to specify other fields like the description. So I just literally say the type. That's a shorthand syntax there. Um, and then I've got this function here called resolve. Now what this allows me to do is for this very specific type, I can choose what I want it to be able to return to me, um, how I want it to get that result. Do I want it to run a query? Do I want it to return some kind of scalar value? Do I want it to look up from like a, a map array? Um, now this is great when on like a smaller scale, um, but you don't want to have to do that for every single one of your entities. Um, so what you can use is you can use a default field resolver um, and you can say, hey, um, if it's on, uh, take this type, pass it into like this, this particular type of object and then run this through my ORM, for example, if you're using an ORM. Um, and it can then resolve all the fields for you um, and do that magically, essentially, without you having to specify what would end up being quite a lot of complex logic every single time. Now, that's great. But if you want to do it all this automatically, you can use API Platform. API Platform is great. Um, I really like it for this kind of thing uh, when you want to just, uh, for sort of rapid application development, if you can just spin it up, you define your entities uh, in something like Doctrine ORM, if you're just doing CRUD, um, and then it will automatically generate a GraphQL uh, thing for it. The only step you have to do is requiring that other GraphQL library and it will automatically enable itself. Really cool. Um, I will very quickly show you this because I'm beginning to run out of time. Um, essentially what I've got on here, um, 
is I've just got an example of that GraphQL script. Um, you can't see that at the back. Uh, no, it's not what I wanted. Um, so here I'm specifying a field um, under query, uh, Michael's name. I'm specifying a type, and I want it to always, always resolve the string true. Um, then I've got all of this bootstrapping, which basically says, like, do graph, GraphQL stuff. Um, and when I execute this, then it returns uh, a JSON blob, which you can't see, um, down here, which just says the data, Michael's name, foo. So that's like a working GraphQL on my laptop, like in, what, like 40 lines of code. Um, so REST versus GraphQL. Uh, now, Phil put this really well in it. So he did a blog article when GraphQL came out because everyone was like, hey, GraphQL, this thing's amazing. Um, I'm going to replace all the REST APIs that I've got with it. Um, now, then that caused the backlash of GraphQL is rubbish, don't use it for everything. Um, and then you ended up with kind of like this, this, this uh, conflict. Um, REST and GraphQL are totally different. They're completely different. They do different things. They do it in a different way. Um, GraphQL isn't a magic bullet, nor is it better. It's, it doesn't solve all of your problems. It's not a replacement for REST. It's an alternative to REST. You can use both of them at the same time. Um, some, pro, um, some companies do. Um, GraphQL is great for if you're working very closely with your mobile developers, for example, and you just want to give them access to everything. Um, you don't want to have any information visibility. Um, it's really great if you use it right, um, if you use it for the right things. But don't just think, oh, hey, I'm just going to jump over and use GraphQL because it's better than REST. Um, it's not better than REST. It's an alternative to REST. Um, REST is, um, a of, is very built on HTTP. Um, it has no specification. It has no set of tools. Um, whereas GraphQL is very specific. It's a query language. It has a specification. It has these tools available to you. I can jump on GitHub Sing and I can run queries and it can auto-complete it with complete rubbish. Like, why would you not want that? Um, but it can also optimize for like flexibility and um, performance. You are always specifying the fields you want. You don't have to have this like mega include at the end of your GraphQL, uh, end of your REST API link. Versioning is great. Because, so versioning your APIs is bad in general, right? Um, if you've got v1, v2, v3, um, please stop. Um, a much better way to version your APIs is to deprecate fields um, and very simply um, just come up with a new name for, na a name for the endpoint. Um, so for example, you might change from like users to people or something like that if you really need to make a, bre a breaking change. But it's much better to just not make a breaking change. It's, and with GraphQL, because you're always specifying the exact fields that you want, it's very easy to know exactly who is using which fields. Um, and you can reach out to them saying, hey, you're using this deprecated field, and you have been for like two years. Please stop. We're going to get rid of it next month. And you can automate that process. Um, you can automate informing your users that they're using a deprecated part of your API. That's cool. Um, deprecations are much, much better. Um, and it doesn't have any kind of version. You can't do v1 slash GraphQL. Um, what are the issues with GraphQL? I've kind of talked some about some of them already. Caching. Um, it's all on one endpoint. It's all on slash GraphQL. Um, you can't use HTTP, Varnish, and that kind of thing in quite the same way. It also, because lots of people are going to be requesting different fields, um, it makes caching a complete nightmare. Because instead of having one endpoint that everyone is always hitting, um, they're always requesting a completely different version of even requesting that particular resource. Um, so basically, the answer to caching is be very good at it at lower levels. Um, your authentication, your caching, et cetera, should all be at levels below GraphQL. It should be just above your persistence layer um, in your business logic layer, essentially. Um, use Redis, basically. Um, don't rely on HTTP caching it in quite the same way. But you do have the performance benefit of the fact you're only giving what you need. And finally, information hiding. The whole point of GraphQL is you don't hide information. The point is you give them exact access to whatever they want. Front-end developers love GraphQL um, because it means that they can just develop without having to constantly ask the back-end team for extra um, changes to be made. It can help speed up development of your back-end team because suddenly you're no longer having to constantly respond to the front-end team. Um, and uh, you haven't got that, that dependency in quite the same way. You just give them the API, and they can do all the stuff. Um, but if you want to do information hiding, that's not really what it's designed for. 
Um, I think that's all I've got time for. If not, I can show you a couple of more quick demos. Yeah, okay. Um, so I can jump over onto here. Um, what shall I show you? Um, so let's have a look at some errors very quickly. Um, oh, that actually, oh yeah, okay, that works. Um, so when you're looking at errors, it will give you all of the details you need. So for example, it will tell you exactly where your error is. If I had a function name up here, it would tell me the exact function that was erroring. Um, uh, and it gives you essentially an error, just like a JSON would. 